Today, we commemorate a loss to one of my favorite headphones. You were here for us along the journey and now you're gone. Rest in peace to my Audio Technica M40s. Now I got these Apple headphones. <laughs> What's up everybody, it's your boy Lou back at it again and today we're reacting to a sad album, Ocean Boulevard. It's a lot of depressing things happening in this episode. First and foremost, it's the last, epi it's the last episode of the Lana Del Rey songs. I'm kind of scared what to do afterwards. I don't know what I'm reacting to after this. I just laid to rest my headphones and uh, everybody's saying this is going to be a very depressing album and I'm going to cry. I know what I'm getting myself into. This is my first time reacting to it. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> now, a lot of people have been saying that I need to react to snippets, but uh, I already have a strike on my channel, so I don't want to get more strikes. I'm very scared. Also, I want to shout out one of the chatters that told me not to react to one of the music videos. I think there's only one music video for this album, so yeah, we're just going to go straight music, no music videos. I appreciate y'all for coming with me throughout this journey all the faces that I've seen in the comments everything that everybody's been saying towards me all the kind stuff if you guys got any suggestions for the next thing uh, comment down below I do know I skipped some songs especially from ultra violence I accidentally listened to those all right I apologize we're gonna get on to Ocean Boulevard I'm scared <laughs> Alright, so first and foremost, we don't have any lyrics on this, so I'm kind of scared about that. Also, the first song is called The Grants. The Grants. Like Lizzie Grant, The Grants. Like her family. <sighs> After Meet the Grams and people in the comments saying that this is going to be the most depressing Lana Del Rey album that I'm going to experience, those combination is twisting my brain, bro. Like, it's giving me a lot of red flags around this. Uh, like I'm scared already to interact with this and I hope it's not as emotionally daunting and bleak as a and w from the first reaction so this is like a full circle moment for me <laughs> without a further ado the grants I am scared as fuck. I've been holding off I've been holding off I'm scared I'm scared I'm scared I'm scared all right let's go one two ready I'm with you Mine. Say it again. Mine of you. What? The line is not even the beginning. What? It's all choir. I wonder what we're getting ourselves into. A whole choir is starting. I know John Baptiste is a part of this as well. I don't know if he's helping in the background with producing and stuff. Oh, yeah, I'm scared. Like Rocky Mountain High. The way John Denver sings. It feels like I'm going back to black church right now. I'm, I'm still scared. I'm still scared. Okay. Do you think about heaven? <sighs> Bro, we, we came in and we came in really depressing. I thought them chords were gonna go into like even deeper. I'm very scared. Can you tell? What? Memories. That's sad. The only thing you take with you to the afterlife is your memories. After you're gone, the memories are gone, bro. And the only thing left that your family gets, it might be your material possessions, but it's the memories as well. Bro. Oh my god, bro. If this is gonna get ah, fuck. Taking a, the bad times and the good times with her. Oh, fuck, bro. Bro, you know what this sounds like? This sounds like when you, your sight gets real blurry. You don't know what's happening around you. And these are like the final thoughts. Peaceful, angelic music in the background is like the light shining on your face and being like, it's time to go. Talking about the, the memories I'm going to take with me when I die is the birth of my sister's kid and my grandmother's last smile. If it gets more... 
I don't know, man. I'm already teary-eyed. Because of y'all, y'all told me this going to be depressing. If it gets worse, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. All right, so the grants. Before we start, we, we get the angelic music, the background singers, which makes me feel like the angels. It makes me feel like it's the gateway. It makes me feel like church. Lana is on her knees just praying to God like something. She's talking about a pastor a lot. It seems very religious in a way. But let's actually get into it. The intro has a very important context clue with the mention of John Denver's song, Rocky Mountain High. I've never listened to John Denver unless it's the incest anthem. West Virginia. Rocky Mountain High is about a guy who turned 27 years old who felt reborn as a new man while adventuring out into the Colorado mountains. He reflects about life and thinks about the people he lost along the journey to becoming a new man. It's an intimate overall great song that I listened to while writing my notes and it makes me want to listen to John Denver after this. It totally relates to what we listen to in this song. We come into a dilemma here for verse one. There's two ways for me to depict this first verse but one thing is for certain Lana is hesitant to pick up this relationship with a guy that is either someone who's very much family oriented loves his immediate family and his extended ones as well or someone who's already has a family and sees lana as a side hustle like a side chick damn i don't know where lana be getting these guys but yet fuck man they ain't shit men usually are a metaphor about lana's career so hold your horses actually that's true thank you voiceover lou no problem man now stop wasting time like shut up editor lou okay damn i don't even remember recording this i heard that what the fuck how do you Get back what? to fucking work, nigga. What the fuck is going on in this video? The pre-chorus is kind of heavy. We talk about death, the afterlife, and overall religious themes. Lana asks this man if he thinks about heaven because the only thing you take to your grave are memories. And do you think about me and are there memories worth keeping? I've always thought about this, especially when I get very paranoid about death and see close ones leave this earth. In death, your memories are gone. Something that's very intimate and everyone cherishes. That's why Alzheimer's scares the living shit out of me and witnessing it is fucking depressing those memories are so important to one's being so in death they just disappear with and the people you experience life with have them until they die whether it's hateful or in a loving demeanor so that do you think about me line is such a powerful one to me at least is this relationship important enough to where you look back when you're on death's door does he think about her because she does and that's why this chorus is so good lana is saying she'll do it for him or the audience she's locked in with this motherfucker when I knew we, I knew we had something kind of, that's why we locked in like this, bro, hell. And she locked in with us. The second verse is an allegory for Lana's trials and tribulations to get to where she is now. She fought tooth and nail to get what she got. She did this shit for her family. Then Lana circles back to the pre-chorus and chorus to let that shit sink in. The good, the bad, and the ugly. She's gonna cherish the whole journey. It's just like in Rocky Mountain High. Then we get to the bridge. We have a list of things Lana will take with her for her deathbed. The memories of her sister's firstborn, her grandmother's last smile. This is heavy. If this is the direction that I think it's going to in this album, it might be up there with some rap songs in depression. If there's a point to where we get an auditory recreation of the moments right before someone you know died or losing a loved one, I'm breaking into tears. You hear that? That's how it fucking feels the second you learn that someone you love passed away and it hits your fucking amygdala. This shit makes you want to fucking cry. All right, I'm scared, 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 bro. It's a beautiful first track to get to though. Ah, I, I give her that. If it gets too heavy, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping the video and I'm gonna record it the next day. I'm, I'm not even gonna lie to you. I, I, I'm dead ass. Do I'm not crying on, on camera? All right, next track. Did you know that there's a tunnel under? Ocean Boulevard. Hey, if there's one thing about Lana albums and Lana songs that I do have a gripe with, the titles are way too long. I can't remember shit, especially the last song off of NFR. I can't remember any of these song titles, bro. Baby, I can't read all that shit. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I gotta go copy and paste this shit if I ever have to write it in my notes, man. God damn. Anyways, did you know there's a tunnel under Ocean Boulevard? I didn't know. All right, let's find this out, man. Let's learn about this. We're going to class. Ooh, we starting off clean. So angelic. Did you know that there's a tunnel under ocean? I didn't know. Up by two man -made walls. And I'm 
this sounds like Bay Street. There's a tunnel, but it's a subway station that's like fucking closed off and only used for like movie production. And it's been used a lot in Toronto. So, you know, Toronto gets it. Open me up. Tell me you like it. Fuck me to death. What did he say? Oh. Love me until I love myself. What? She's talking about renovating, right? Who writes a song where you... <laughs> Yo, she's using renovation as an allegory and metaphor for getting fucked. I don't know. All right, I'm yapping. Is it gonna be my turn? When is it don't gonna be my turn? Me. Okay. Open me. Tell me you like me. Fuck me to death. Fuck that line still takes me out. That's. Don't forget me. If this is one thing I want to say about this song and the two songs already, whoever mixed this motherfucker, this is a fabulous mix. It's so different from the past two albums because those were like very country heavy. This one's just like going back to like the, what, what do they call Lana's music? Baroque pop music. I don't know what that means, but bro, it's like going back to NFR. It's just warming. Even though I think this song is very depressing. Let's be honest. She's comparing herself to an abandoned tunnel underneath ocean boulevard that's forgotten she really saying don't forget about me bro did you know there's a tunnel it's just like me don't forget about me my nigga. please i don't know if this was like two albums blue banister and chemtrails that like put a lot of people off and they're like yeah we gonna make lana fall off type shit it's the fall off albums anyways we gonna look into it i'm gonna take some notes let's go did you know that there's a tunnel under ocean boulevard so lana took us to class and taught us about some local lore so i did some digging to expand what she used said in the lyrics and about local LA Orange County history. The tunnel under Ocean Boulevard is indeed a real place and I think most of y'all know because she posted it on IG months before this came out but I'm a new fan as of yeah, two months ago. So I wouldn't have known. The tunnel is called Jargon's Tunnel and Lana describes it perfectly actually. Mosaic ceilings, painted tiles on the wall, handmade beauty sealed up by two man-made walls. In fact, it closed in 1967. Shout out to Long Beach Public Library for the knowledge. Here, Lana is comparing herself to Jargon's Tunnel, saying her body is marred or disfigured her soul. Now, I don't know if this is a reflection in which Lana is dealing with her self-image issues. We talked about it in earlier your videos on um, how people really crossed the line and body shaming her on the internet we talked about how she was trying to own it in blue banister but we really didn't see the aftermath only what happened in the moment with black bathing suit to say she feels closed off because of it just like jargon's tunnel is beautifully dark and i'm only using the context clues from what we have so far in a and w and the pre-chorus i'm really liking the verses leading to the pre-chorus that goes into the chorus so seamlessly lana asks when is it gonna be my turn which goes into the chorus open me up and tell me you like it saying when it's time to open up people will poke and prod at lana they'll exhaust her in any which way the part i love is love me until i love myself which is crazy but i don't think this means lana will find love from people that hate her only in death which most artists never get to experience love until they die this reminds me of mac miller august 3rd 2018 is when swimmings came out the same day as astro world by travis scott people People shit on Mac Miller heavy. I read Travis Scott was very hot around that time. They were saying Mac Miller fell off. Mac Miller who? Twitter and Reddit were just devious, man. And just giving him a copious amount of hate. And then not even a month later, he OD'd. And everything changed. I think everybody's reflection on Mac Miller's music changed after Swimmings came out. I still can't listen to his music to this day. I never listened to Circles. I've never listened to anything Mac Miller after his death. I couldn't even get through Swimming. Because it was so fucking painful. This is what I'm getting from this song. Uh, I, I'm getting a little emotional right now. I'm not gonna lie. People will only love you at death. <sighs> Rest in peace, Mac Miller, for real. Yo, this is super deep and impactful to mention. Oh, fuck. The mention of Hotel California by the Eagles is a reference just like Rocky Mountain High. We'll get to it, but here we get into a few things. Lana self-referencing Honeymoon with God Knows I Tried, where Lana is talking about singing Hotel California pre and post fame and how her family changed. Here, Lana is describing how the art itself is a preservation in time and how the feeling of, to a song can transport you to pivotal times in your life in which the song has been important to the listener. Here, 
here Alana is using the metaphor of both the song Hotel California in which the song is about the trappings of fame and the doors that can lead to heaven and hell and Lana saying the same while also remembering the times before. This is where it all unwinds and it gets to the pits of despair. Here we get to another song reference that Lana lays which is Don't Forget About Me by Harry Nilsson. It was a frequent Beatles collaborator and close friend to I think the whole band. If I'm gonna be honest I never listened to a Beatles song in my life outside of the famous ones and Paul McCartney's temporary secretary. Uh, maybe I should listen to the Beatles next. I don't know. Don't Forget About Me is about a father losing custody and knowing that he won't see his kids as much as he wants. He tells his kids and is absent that they should enjoy their childhood but also keep good memories that they had together and never forgetting that he loves his kids. Lana here makes a note that at two minutes and five seconds in the song Harry's voice breaks as he's emotional while performing the track in the studio. We can't blame him for that. Probably at that moment he's fucking depressed. Matter of fact John Lennon was a producer of the whole album that this song is from who coached them through the tough songs while having emotional breakdowns in recording. Lana wish she had the same type of support but at the end she knows that she won't take it the way that Harry Nielsen would. She can't thrive in the support only the paint and we know that. We've seen it in the past album. <sighs> It is depressing, bro. Y'all were right. This shit is depressing, man. I almost broke down. I almost broke down, man. Rest in peace to fucking Mac Miller, man. Uh, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't think I can ever listen to his songs ever again, bro. All right, sweet. We're already two songs in. It's already too heavy for me. Jesus. Fuck. Why is this depressing? Some basic bitch go to the Beverly Center and find A sick bitch? Jesus Christ! If I'm not there, come to my house on Genesee. Genesee? Like Hennessy? The Henny! You want children? Do you want to marry me? Yeah, you want do you want it? Thongs and long beach by the sea. She's talking about GTA 5 missions right now. I remember doing all them things in GTA 5 with uh, Franklin or Michael. And find me where no one will be. God. This sounds like music that you would get on the ending credits. This is beautiful, bro. Now, if I read the lyrics and I get more depressed, I, I'm taking a day off. And y'all saying, oh my God, where is the video? Where is the video? That's why I'm taking days off because I don't want to have this emotional fucking... I'm going to try and do it in one take. But let's be honest. I'm taking this in. This is beautifully arranged. But if this gets more depressing, God only knows I'm taking a day off and I'm going to do the reaction tomorrow. I'm not dealing with this. I'm not crying, bro. I almost cried and a and w next oh my god bro sweet is beautiful man if this is like beautiful depressing oh fuck all right so sweet i really like how this song has one verse one bridge and one chorus and nothing else it's like a stream of consciousness i really enjoyed this man so for the verse let's break it down there's a lot of references to break down here this album has two songs and already we're getting dense themes and references going all around and this is what makes me love lana's work so here lana's inner thoughts about what took place in chemtrails and blue banister while hiking griffith park a famous hiking spot in la where yes you'll see a lot of stars and maybe that's what she was trying to say also stars in her eyes also might link to exhaustion here lana talks about writing a note filled with her emotions before leaving the midwest but she never gave it to the person that she intended to give it to she said that she learned this from women in la which really just sounds like something that oprah did back in 05 06 i fucking remember that i was a kid back then but I was watching Oprah every day. Don't don't judge me for that. Where you write everything you ever want to say about a person into a letter, but you never send it. You just let everything out. You let everything go. Uh, Lana's a talented writer. She even says it with the line, I've got magic in my hands and stars in my eyes. Lana is bigging herself up that much. She wrote something to the point that she was moved by her own work. Cry so hard, you might fuck around and have stars in your eyes type shit. You ever do that, bro? You have stars in your eyes while crying? That's how it feels. 
man. So we get to the chorus. Here Lana tells you who she really is. Not the typical woman you find in LA who's vapid and entrenched in consumer goods. She's raw and well-intentioned. The line, I'm sweet, bare feet demonstrates that. And side note, I'm just glad there's no music video for this. I can't take the sight of footage of bare feet again. I got feet phobia. It's a real thing. I get it. It's a weird fear. Please don't make fun of me for it. I might as well be in a Mori episode about being scared of mustard. But for me, it's fucking bare feet. This shit scares the fuck out of me. I hate that shit. Lana then tells the person she's willing to adventure out within herself. Go deep within her emotional depths, away from LA, vapidness, and into the wilderness. The mention of North Country alludes to that. Lana then mentions if she's not there, she's also in her home in Genesee. I had to look up where that was, and it's super interesting because there's a street in both LA and Staten Island, both cities, that's very important to Lana with the same name, Genesee. Also, she mentions North Country, which is also a region in New York State, which encompasses Essex County, where Lana is from, Lake Placid. I think all of this really just alludes to Lana trying to find peace of mind, being at home. Not the house itself, but emotionally at home and inviting people she cares about in it. It's very intimate. And this is where we get to the crux of it all. The deeper conversations with this guy she's with. She questions if this guy is really committed or just wanting to only hook up. She wants to know this guy and how he really thinks. She asks questions that at first are something you would hear from a family or close acquaintance with some sort of power. Uh, here is Flip. What are you really doing with your life? What does it really mean in the grand scale of it all? Do you think about life and what it means on some Carl Sagan Nietzsche type shit? But here's what it all means. When it's all said and done, when Lana settles down, there's no more music, just nothing. She wants her life. She did this for her family. I think in the grants, Lana hints that she sacrificed so much to get to where she is now. She did this all for her family and the memories along the way are special and to not forget about that. In Tunnel Under the Ocean Boulevard, the reference to Don't Forget Me with Harry losing custody over his kids, it really comes together to spell out, I don't want to split work with family. I just want to be here for the family. So she knows what she's doing with her life. Does it align with his and vice versa? It's really a, a mirror moment from Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. Lana chooses herself. I wrote over 750 words, like basically a tight essay. I kept fucking up for a song that has a hundred plus words. I'm not even saying everything I want to say. I can literally write a whole video essay, an hour video essay about this song and my thoughts. We going deep, bro. Uh, it's like a big bang, man, for the finale. We doing a big bang for the finale. We're going to get into the deep depression with A&W. I know I already reacted to it the first time around, but I want to have better context. We already have references to chemtrails in this song. So I'm going to like play the song, fast forward myself listening to it, and then we're going to get into what I missed, what I think about the lyrics and all that. All right. All right. The dreaded a and I'm taking breaks every time I'm writing something. I don't, I don't know if I can do it in full one sitting, man. I don't know. I haven't seen my mother in a long, long time. Man, there's a lot of added context behind the, the mother part. After Blue Bannister, a whole lot of context. All right, there's a reason why I have to re-listen to it now. I was in the blind listening to this as my first song. Now I understand why everybody was saying, why is this the first song you reacted to? There's a whole backdrop, a whole discography of music just to know what the fuck Lana's talking about. This was like an insight song this is the experience of, of an american whore it still gets me i even though i've already listened to this song it's still like that line just still gets me i think this is where it gets fucking dark as shit this part is where it gets dark i i fucking hate this part so much mommy look at my hair look at the length of it and the shape of my body if i told you that i was being do you really think that anybody would think I didn't ask for it? Fuck! Won't testify I already fucked up my story on top of this. I don't think I can get through this. Holy shit. I don't think I can get through this. I don't think I can get through this. If there's a long pause, if there's a pause, if there's a cut right here, just know like I broke. Dead ass, I don't think I can, I don't think I can go through this song again. This shit breaks me every fucking time. Like I try to listen to this song after the reaction and during the reaction when I was editing. It just didn't sit right and I just never listened to it after that.
This is Jimmy from Ultra Violence. The Jim Bean, the abusive Jimmy. Yeah, this this got real depressing real quick. When you have all the added context from all the uh, previous albums, this song gets ah uh, fuck me. Okay, so that was A and W. With so much added context, just learning more and more about Lana over the past few months, this is so much darker than my first reaction. Like I'm on the edge of shedding tears. And, uh, like this is the auditory version of a self portrait done by Francis Bacon. This song is about Lana's spiraling mental state, trauma, self-inflicted habits of self-sabotaging, overall coping with depression through sex and drugs and split into two parts, the depression and the high. So in part one, we see the underlying trauma that we discovered from Blue Bannister with Lana's relationship with her mother, haunting her during her depressive episodes the memories we keep encountering in the past songs while sometimes remembering the good also coming with an asterisk we see lana's thoughts embodying her mother's criticizing her body weight her hair and growing frustrated that the press are the exact same way here it seems like lana is saying that maybe the toxicity within a relationship with her mother was a net positive whether she's thin or not the ideal shape people want her to be, she still feels like shit either way. She doesn't care anymore. So in the pre-chorus, we then see Lana make a metaphor comparing her mental state with the city of Rosemead, which is a peaceful suburb in LA County, and the Ramada Hotel, which is not the prettiest hotel, but it gets the job done, right? If you want to take a stay, you go there. Lana uses that to hook up with people and just get fucked up on drugs. She uses the hotel so much that she just lives there now. And what did Luther Vandross say? <laughs> We're seeing the bottomless pit start to widen when she's kind of waving the depressing statement away. Like this is the new normal. In the chorus, we see this full display of what not caring is. Just needing a body to be there for the moment of loneliness. Lana doesn't care where she's using this person. She's using this person like a drug to push away the thoughts and echoes in her head. The experience of an American whore is what she's doing. In verse two, we see Lana making more references to other pieces of media. While I think the mention of forensic files was kind of a throwaway mention, cause let's be honest, you flip on A&E or History Channel, that motherfucker is playing everywhere, every day until prime time. But the teenage diary of a girl is a different story. That one goes hand in hand with the song itself. It's a movie about a 15 year old aspiring cartoonist who has a lot of image issues and self-confidence issues that's set in the 1970s. She then loses her virginity to her mother's boyfriend and starts exploring her sexuality after that. In the movie, they try to play it off like she's a triumph and she celebrates it, but you're a victim like her and her friend also do like prostitution cosplaying and end up in a threesome with said boyfriend of her mother like bro i only read the synopsis i might have to read the movie after i'm done with this video just to get a full glimpse and re-record this part maybe i don't know but yeah don't watch the movie i swear to god i turned that bitch off after 30 minutes and just read the script and even then i felt disgusted it felt like an adam 16 type of production 2000s and 2010s teen rom-coms comedies whatever were such a weird Weird vibe at least like what at least the movie was directed written and produced by women with a majority women-led cast and crew in a book that was written by a, a woman that was adapted to the full screen so i don't know there's a lot of parallels between this song and the movie and it makes lana think when did it all go wrong for her and starts to question herself that movie is crazy to even say out loud i'm not even gonna lie to you so in verse three we then get to the darkest part of the song and i think i covered it pretty well the first time around but this depression is leading deeper into a bottomless pit and it's horrible but you know what's crazy it's true this also happened in the teenage diary of a girl as well which makes this all more depressing. I don't know how I'm gonna look at the camera while doing this. This is, this is 
then we get to part two which was the high lana is back to her old friend jimmy her poison her love her darling she's back on the wagon drinking coking smoking also i think lsd much like in teenage diary lana's lost it and is on a binge she doesn't care anymore and i think she does reference herself both in the third and first person references her mom that she hasn't talked to in a while yeah she called and lana doesn't care this is a byproduct of that trauma in the chorus the if you live and love is also yeah the fact that there's an if in the lyrics this can just spiral till lana sees the light it's at that point of contention i can't believe i re-reacted to this and i already put it out but it's needed and i know i have a whole discography guiding my thoughts on this now i'm taking a break after this i'm not gonna lie to you all right so we got judah smith's interlude i took like an hour break i went to make some music i will never show you my music uh, this is not a platform where i you know what i mean i make trash music i never show anybody that i just had to get something out my chest say some things and that's it i am back refreshed an hour later no more depression sort of depression but uh yeah we're gonna get to judah smith's interlude this is a heavy ass fucking album okay Also, look at the picture of what I'm looking at while I'm listening to this music. Look at this picture. For a second, let's actually... Look, it's depressing as fuck. Like, I fucking hate life, okay? Th this is what I'm looking at while listening to depressive ass music. Niggas gonna say, why are you listening to one take? Fuck you. I'm fucking sad, bro. And I need to deal with it. Not on camera. I'm not gonna give you the crying clip. After you, paper. you get to love, you ever talk to somebody, I want a new life. I don't love my wife anymore. I don't love my kids anymore. Missing okay. out on life, they're usually my age. Whoa. Does that sound like love? No. It's a life dominated with lust. Who, who, is this Lana like recording a whole like church sermon? Or is this from the internet? Jesus Christ. Help me love what I got. Help me love what's in front of me. Okay. Help me want more of my wife and more of my friends. And yes. Serve the city I live in and not wish it away and hope I can move. Mm. That means I don't have to go. This man either sounds passionate or erratic. And the music in the background is it making me feel like there's a realization happening, but also I'm still getting sad at the same time. Talking about the husband not loving his wife no more, chasing lust. Jesus Christ. And then the person in the background, I don't even know if that's Lana or not. If it's Lana, that's even more depressing. It's just like, yeah, yeah, I agree. It's like, fuck, bro, we just got back from like A&W, dog. So it's just. Okay, anyway, I just <laughs> <laughs> so I get to the verse of the day, here's the verse of the day today. Why? You're the star reader, you're the ocean maker, yeah, yeah. you're the whale creator, you're the rhino designer. Who are you? Rhino <laughs> designer. Why does it design. feel like a drug trip right now? Created a little lower than Elohim, which is the name of creator God. Artist Whoa. God. You want to call God artist? I used to think my preaching was mostly about you. And you're not gonna like this, but I'm gonna tell you the truth. I've discovered my preaching is mostly about me. Wait, his preaching is mostly about him? What he was thinking about that to his what oh, fuck, bro. Nah, that's actually sad, bro. Did this man say, why am I thinking about this? Because most of my sermons are about me and what I need. And he preaches it. That's depressing. I, I get it. Like pastors have demons too. And pastors aren't perfect. And I think we need to like be all right with that. Like no pastor is perfect. No one's perfect, man. People slip up all the time. People make mistakes all the time. I think we got to forgive, but this was intense also the laughing felt like a drug trip also elohim i only know that from the kendrick song the elohim the rebirth before you get to the father you gotta holler at me first bitch all right track five judah smith interlude judah smith is an la based pastor and this was ripped straight from one of his sermons uh this touches on exact themes that we've been seeing so far in the album that lana is filled with lust and she is now seeking the word of god to help uh, i think also the last part where he said that i thought at the beginning that most of my sermons were about you but they're really about me also kind of reflects on lana as well how most of her 
her songs might be about like fame or whatever but really it's just about her struggles yeah there's a lot of things in that sermon that was just like sad bro and it, it, it's not even like sad in a bad way but it's more sad like this is this is the path bro like everybody goes through it everybody goes through this type of like pain not in like a severe way but you know everybody goes through it and we know that lana's christian that we've seen it in the past albums uh i feel like family ties is a reason elohim has entered the zeitgeist but hey man i mean we can move on <laughs> man this track was kind of kind of eye-opening i'm not gonna lie to you also he was super erratic man that shit was scary the way he was talking about this but I think that later on, we'll probably swing back to this interlude to get more context on what the overall themes of this album is, whether it's forgiveness on themselves and trying to learn past like tragedies you've went through and things of that nature uh, and seeking God and just seeking answers of like, this all does matter. It's just a matter of time of when it matters. All right, Candy Necklace. I did see some of the track list. I saw Tommy Genesis, my Canadian fucking fellow. Let's go. I love her. Kenny necklace. White noise coming out of my brain turns hmm. off for nothing. Okay. Sitting on the sofa, feeling super suicidal. I to say the word, but baby, and on the Bible, I do. What? Oh no, man. Feel like it's you, the one who's bringing me down. Fuck. I think that we should address this Acting like the young and restless Whoa I'm obsessed with this Whoa, whoa, whoa It just, just changed the whole time signature midway through What the fuck? All his nah, that's crazy You got a violin or a horn in the back? Oh my god, bro. Candy necklaces. <sighs> Fuck. I don't know what else to say, bro. It's just all right candy necklace this song is chaotic and depressing bro i'm not gonna lie to you first one we got references for days here well not really for this verse it has like three references for sure though uh first line we got a reference to tulsa jesus freak with the white fire but in tulsa jesus freak it was white hot forever which we know is just raw passion that we have then it was cinnamon on my teeth which is a reference to cinnamon girl on nfr which over there was the thrill of killing Kissing someone after popping pills and getting high with all sorts of colors just like a candy necklace would be as well so I might have some influence on this song then lastly the white noise at the end which is a reference to Yosemite from chemtrails as well where Lana talks about television static was quite overwhelming which is also another form of white noise so we have to add all these together even though Lana feels passionate and thrilled about this relationship even borderline uh, jealous of him in ways because it feels like he has passion about life as well whether it's an actual person or fame itself the white noise can also be the noise of screaming fans this is becoming too overwhelming for lana and she's spiraling nothing can turn it off no matter where she goes and this could be depression it might just be anxiety as well in the pre-course i accidentally clicked on the annotation for this and i'm gonna be honest genius is fucking stupid they thought that rockefeller was a reference to the actual Rockefellers like these people don't have any cultural references or have no culture at all they couldn't put two to two together the way it was written like Lana's is obviously talking about Rihanna's umbrella which also features CEO of Rockefeller records the top boss himself Jay-Z the song is about friends or loved ones being there for each other like they're twins they locked in they'll always be there to support through thick and thin Lana loves this song shout out to the dream who wrote that song but I think this is the underlying theme of wanting someone who is committed like that song. 
that Lana longs for and knows that this relationship is not going to give her that. And yeah, so in the chorus, there's so many interpretations for what's going on. Uh, obviously, they're both zooted. Him dancing like he's young and restless. He's either off of coke or meth or molly. Or maybe he's just like that committed to like his day job that he's restless and feels young and spry and all that. I do think it's molly because the candy necklace reference, uh, which candy with a K and an I at the end is a big thing in rave scenes. Same with molly. Anyways, candy necklace can mean anything but what she's obsessed with. Hey, in Judah Smith's interlude, he, he talks about the passage Psalms chapter eight uh, lines from three to six. Your creative genius glowing in the heavens when I gaze. When I gaze at your moon and your stars mounted like jewels in their settings. Jewels are permanent fixtures and they're crafted and set. Now, I know Judah was talking about God being an artist, but stick with me. I want you to think about that and now compare it to a candy necklace. Candy necklaces have an expiration date. It's food. You eat it and it's gone and thrown out. It's not a permanent nor healthy obsession. B, it could be drugs because candy is molly. We've already gone through that. And then C, the finish remains of candy necklaces is an elastic string over your neck it might also be a reference to a noose lana has suicidal ideations when the fun <sighs> Fuck. Lana has suicidal ideations when the fun time is over and the reality is setting in. I'm sorry, I, I, I had to write everything down because I, it's too heavy, man. In verse two, then we meet with it. The super suicidal thoughts. Lana is honest to God. Hand on the Bible. Do it at testimonies during court times court hearings and at presidential inaugurations and says you are what brings me down now this could be lana talking to the audience and breaking the fourth wall or her just being jealous that he is full of life and kind of is happy with everything that he has going on while lana is still in the depths of hell she's in that bottomless pit still the pressure is building the white noise is getting louder and louder she wants it gone when she says thought that we were cool and we're gonna kick it like a tribe called quest yes kick it means to chill and a tribe called quest has a song by the same name but like every reference that we've had so far dig deeper the song can i kick it by trap called quest has a bunch of puns and play on words about music theory rapping rhyming and overall just having fun making music with friends we also hear in the music the time signature shifting as well as a nod to that uh, just having fun with the music and shifting a lot of things it could be depression as well and shifting into another gear of emotions in which she's being raw and and telling the truth right lana thought this was gonna be just music having fun just kicking it like tribe called quest but it isn't the this music shit is really killing her again this relationship might be about the music industry so there's that then we get to the reframing of the pre-chorus and chorus itself here things change for the darker things are set in stone with lana's sentiment a fortune teller part makes me think of a romeo juliet reference from ultra violence and born to die where a tragic ending is always the best one and maybe it's heading into that direction itself then in the reframed chorus we see lana get tunnel visioned with the candy necklace it seems like the reckless and restless dancing is blurring in the background and the candy necklace is in more focus she knows that it needs to be addressed but like white noise it's closing it and it's getting louder all right 30 minute break let's go okay let's not have an emotional breakdown on this one john basti's interlude let's go what the fuck i feel like he took like acid or something acid or shrooms just like boom i can feel it it popped in early but they experimenting right now. I feel like I need to have like the, the lights off and then just like experiencing this. God damn. Okay, so maybe I didn't need to take a break. This was like a drug trip. This is like a good interlude to like break up that depressing ass fucking music. Oh fuck, I don't think I need to do a little, hey man, we gotta break it down. But it was a good, it was good music, man, to have in the background, bro. Kintsugi, all right? There's a certain point the body can't come back from. Okay. In one year we've learned the turn. The depth that the chest cavity 
What is that supposed to mean? Chucky was there for three out of three. Okay. I was there for the third because I couldn't be there for the one who was closest. But I've had to let it break a little more. Because they say that's what it's for. Oh, no. Nah. I think I just put two and two together right there. Why Why would you look at someone's chest cavity and, like, their mouth moving and talk about three of three and then being there on the third one and not being there for your loved one? She's talking about someone on their deathbed. I'm so glad I'm not talking because I know if I if I talk I'm about to cry bro like Is it getting worse man this reminds me of like losing grandparents and shit i even being there for the final moments that's the scary part at least she was there i hope she understands like being there in the final moments is at least like good some people don't even get to be there in the final moments bro that shit breaks you track eight kanasugi <sighs> we getting deeper and deeper into the trenches with lana's emotions so in the first verse we were hearing lana memorize and visualize what it was like to witness someone she was very much close with in the family dying in a hospital they're on pins and needles he could pass any day at any moment and there's so much anxiety and paranoia of the of what's going on and, and what i'm hearing from it over the past year he's just been looking worse and worse and he's just been looking incredibly unwell they were looking at his mouth whether it was twitching or not looking at his chest seeing if he was breathing lana describes her sister chucky being there three of three times which i think means emergency hospital visits and lana only making it to the third and final visit the last days of this man's life on earth and this is someone that lana cherishes so much she wants to run because she can't take seeing this person she loves die she doesn't trust herself in the grief <sighs> But she has no options but to let it happen and just to let it be. And then we get to the chorus where we get another reference. And this time we get it from Leonard Cohen's Anthem, a political song about freedom fighters. I think it's about the ANC turning the tides in South Africa and getting closer to the end of an apartheid state. The lyric starts with, uh, there's a crack, crack in everything. And that's the part Lana references. That's how the light gets in. And this outlook on grieving is important for Lana to face it head on instead of running and continuously grieve when the moment approaches it's mature uh verse two in the final moments of this person's life when people are cherishing what little time they have left with him lana can't keep herself together we see his mental rapidly deteriorate where he's clutching on lana's wrist during his final moments he's about to use his hands to cover his mouth not realizing that he's clutching lana's and using her hand instead uh, the thought of this being his final days then makes Lana ask herself what would it look like for her if it happened in the moment. And she can only think of the guy that she's potentially seeing being on her side. <sighs> Fuck, fuck. In the first bridge, this feels like a direct callback to the intro of the Grants uh, in the John Denver song as well. Lana is running away after a loved one passed, just like the character in Rocky Mountain High. She thought she could take it. She thought the broken heart can be healed, but she can't find herself healing. She keeps picking at the scab. She calls her father just for emotional support in these trying times, and that's all she can do. She's grieving alone, and it's hard. And honestly, it's something one shouldn't do by themselves at the be surrounded by family i don't know why 
god that's fun in verse 3 there's a lot of elements to this verse here and i might be wrong but hear me out solana references lyrical and in full there's a crack in everything and i think here we get references to the burial and the funeral itself lana essentially stating that she's closed off in this moment but the light still got in she then references kantasugi which is a japanese technique of repairing broken pottery but fusing the broken pieces with gold this transforms the chorus into another meaning of healing the broken pieces and the broken parts of herself with the help of the people around her the light she then starts to talk about the funeral reception and how that went and then in bridge two even though lana is letting in the light obviously grieving a lost one doesn't up and disappear after one meeting or one call or one day it takes time and she's still struggling but at the very least she knows she's not alone in that struggle and she's gonna get through it and i hope she does i think i need to take another break i i, I gotta get through it man uh, if i cry i cry i was close here i was close to crying here i'm dead ass this this puts me back bro this puts me back at a bad time <sighs> all right fingertips all right fingertips god that took a second when i look back tracing fingertips over plastic bags They said I can't handle it. I can't handle it in my mind. All I remember from the last album was that the, the bipolar diagnosis. And now that's coming back. And the fingers over plastic bags. I don't know if she's talking drugs or something. But if it is, it's like... <sighs> I didn't think it was gonna be this hard. Y'all were right. This is like the end of NFR, but with 16 fucking tracks. At least with that. There was some uptune type shit. This is just straight fucking hell, my nigga. What are we doing? I need one happy song. Come on, man. I guess I'll be It wasn't my idea, the cocktail of things that twist neurons inside. But without them, I'd die. No. Yo, shut the fuck up, and Lana. What the fuck? <laughs> if I take my life, find your astral body, put it into my eyes. Lana, just shut the fuck up. I don't even want to hear this shit no more. I feel it right here. I am trying everything I can to stop myself from fucking crying, my nigga. I'ma thug it out. I'ma thug it out. I was in Monaco. I couldn't hear what they said on the telephone. Gave myself two seconds to cry. It's a shame that we die. This is like the most important time in your life. You're singing to a prince and you find out two hours before that he died. <sighs> at least, at least, at least, at least we didn't get like an auditory like reconstruction of like how that actually felt. Hopefully. When uh, I was 15, naked next to a neighbor's did a drive by, pulled me up by my waist, long head to the beach side. I wanted to go out like you, swim with the fishes, but he caught on Rhode Island beaches. But sometimes it's just not your time. I need two seconds right now, bro. I need two hours. I need two two days, two years. I don't, I don't think y'all guys are getting this reaction anytime soon. At one point, she talked about attempting at 15 and being envious of a nigga that died uh, i don't know what to say like this is hard for me to even talk bro like fuck you lana like jesus christ bro no nah, fuck you
Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. I wrote down my thoughts. I have jokes in this motherfucker. I don't know if I'm gonna get through the jokes because I'm teary eyed and just no more context is, is breaking me. My nigga is fucking breaking me. So let's just go on with this thinking this is gonna be like a, a, a regular like note read of like what I found out from this and, and talk about my thoughts on the song. But you already know, it's just fuck you, Lana. This shit is too heavy, bro. Like fuck, fingertips. There was a lot of shit in here that, that that was like I had to read into it a lot. It took me like an hour to write this through, and it is breaking my fucking heart. It feels like I'm like reading a textbook at some parts, and I'm like super elated. But the more I read into it, the more it's just like sadder and sadder and sadder, and it's just like depressing, bro. But anyways, so first, first, I think we're seeing Lana pan out and look at her life and what has it become, and is reflecting, seeing the plastic bags over her fingertips might mean an assortment of coke and pill baggies that she's gotten over time and just piling up her state of mind at the time was good intentioned but misguided from her state of mind she wants to explain herself for the misunderstandings of her past and maybe talking to us or just the audience in general of her past controversies like the letter or the mass stuff but and the list goes on but it's really just more deep and just more depressing because a lot of things tied to the last previous hour albums and having all the foresight now is yeah he needed those past albums to like really understand this shit it's fucking it's breaking me bro verse two took me some time to know what the fuck a, a telemore is or a telomere and what it gotta do with extinction in time on Lana's part. I don't know if Lana went to biochem or like she has a degree in biochem or she went to school and then dropped out, but she, I don't know where she found out what the fuck a telemore is, but maybe she just reads books. Here we see Lana question her fate, her career, her family, and her longevity. I don't know if this means that Lana was on the brink of ODing or just seeing that she binged so much that the end result of her habits might lead down to death, but she asked herself if she'll die or get to the 10 year mark being relevant will, will she be aging gracefully and timeless if she is and if people will be by her side in those moments this can also be said if she didn't make it either will her family be there when she's gone in verse 3 this verse kind of confirms what i know and knew in blue banisters wildflower wildfire with lana admitting that she has bpd she looked out for her siblings charlie and chuck and is concerned if her niece is all right we then get to lana questioning if she'll have a kid of her own we go deeper into not if she can but if she's able to not physically but on a mental health standpoint i was trying to read up on being bipolar during pregnancy and it seems daunting as fuck and it's met with a lot of obstacles in the way just planning to get through nine months without medication and then we have later on in the song that if she doesn't take her meds she'll die so sadly sadly she can't she can't be a mother and even afterwards i think the doubt placed is if lana would even be a good mother but it seems like lana's been taking care of her younger siblings like the mother that they needed anyways we can go back to cherry blossom where lana is protective over her sister from her mother's abuse and so it's just sown in doubt and it's winning which makes it more depressing but this is revealing as fuck and verse four cuts deeper and fucking deeper here we see lana talk about her psych meds without them she'll die which plays into verse three a pregnancy doesn't matter if you're taking meds just to not die then <laughs> lana then says that if she dies she wants her remains placed in a family mausoleum where her dad grandparents and her uncle goes uncle dave we then understand the references to why lana has been referencing john denver's song rocky mountain high lana's uncle took his life in the colorado mountain rangers r.i.p dave grant lana would die for this man she cherishes him a lot this was her twin this was her everything she'll do anything just to experience two seconds with him even go to the astral planes and watch tv with him <sighs> this is hard bro Verse 5, then Lana describes the moment she found out about her uncle's death. It was two hours before an impromptu performance with the Prince of Monaco, a place where millionaires and billionaires part their assets and shit for scammy tax purposes. It's a place of opulence, but this is Lana's rock bottom. The country will forever be stained with the death of her uncle. It was two hours before her performance, and she gave herself two seconds to cry before even having to go to work and go on stage. She didn't get 
time to grieve. She had to compartmentalize herself, get into it later. This reminds me of Kanye after his mother dying and him never grieving and just fled and worked even harder and more. Like insane hours, touring insanely and he did everything just to not think about his mother's passing. And it just led to him unraveling in the public eye. And now you see what happened to Kanye. Just a meltdown after meltdown. And if there's something I'm happy about is that Lana at least is doing that here. Rather than pushing forward without grieving, she's at least taking time. And at least that's the best we can do with this because it's fucked. Verse six, I think here Lana is talking to Dave Grant. Lana talks about a time where she attempted her life at 15 years old. And I think going into details is gonna make me cry. And I don't wanna do that. I j just, her neighbor saved her and thank God for that. And you know the rest. And then she links it with Dave's favorite thing to do, which was fishing. And then verse seven, we finally see Lana's mother be mentioned, which looking back at verse four shows me Lana's disdain for her mother. She hates her so much. She doesn't even want to invite her mother into her family mausoleum when they die. That resentment that turned into a deep depression. I found myself screaming in the hotel room. I gotta keep it light. If not, this is gonna be depressing as fuck, and I already think it is. We know from Born to Die, this is what makes us girls. And from Blue Bannister's Wildflower Wildfire, Lana was sent away at 15, going on 16 to a mental hospital and then a boarding school. This fucked Lana up. And after 18 years, she's still reeling in that trauma. And this is what makes us girls. We were made to think that Lana was sent away because she was hanging around a bad influence and just bad people in general. But I think the information in verse six is the piece that was missing that made the picture more darker this also makes the karmic lineage line and blue banister makes a lot more sense and this is generational trauma of walking away from the emotional toll of trauma instead of facing it head on to get back into the verse lana displays what she wanted her life to really be to get with her high school sweetheart to be a teen mom and to live in a town that she grew up in and die peacefully or die young. She wanted a common life. I think Lana's path into music was birthed from her in the, in the mental hospital stay. In verse eight, the crush that Lana had, Aaron Green was a real person from Lana's hometown and he died at 23 from a motorcycle accident. Lana envies him wishing she was the one who died instead of him. And Lana gets real angry at her mom's actions and sending her away. It places more trauma than helping her. Then she gives herself two seconds to heal before for going back. In verse 9, there are many more points of contention on what this means to me. First, I'm thinking these two seconds to cry are like a wave of emotions crashing over Lana's head and letting it wash away before she goes on her lust and drug binge once more. I also think this can be linked back to verse 6. And then in verse 10, this really screams to the difference between Lana and Lizzie Grant. Lana is the serene queen, the artist, the well-traveled person that everyone loves, but it's a mess ask for Lizzie, for Elizabeth, the person behind the act, to compartmentalize the loss and the grief. Those two seconds is for Lana to take off the mask and breathe, and to go through the emotional trauma that she's endured, only to put the mask back on because she's got to keep the professional image alive for everyone's sake. It's like revealing K-Fab as Lana is a character and Lizzie isn't. The fourth wall is broken. <laughs> It took me one hour to put this together and this is about to be the longest video I've ever made. <laughs> Please like, comment, and subscribe if you think I'm doing a good job. I need to walk away from this. This is fucking heavy. All right, I left, went to make more music. I really, I really be making a lot of music, man. Anyways, uh, Paris, Texas. I swear I've heard this before. Mm -mm. Was this in a movie or a show? It's probably a movie. It's getting a lot happier though. Thank God. As I would too. Knew they wouldn't understand. God damn. Fuck. This is hard. 
I'm just glad it's like super happy. Oh, I don't think this is a happy song. I don't know. I'm just happy. It's just upbeat. That's all I'm taking right now. I'm just, I'm taking my wins right now. I'm taking my wins. When I took nine depressing losses, I'm gonna take one win. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jam out. Cause I damn near almost cried like 50 times, especially writing. I had a tear going down my fucking cheek writing this shit. Man, y'all don't know about the emotional battles I went through with this shit. <laughs> Why did it end depressing? What's the song? Grandfather, please stand on the shoulders of my father while he deep sea fishing. Oh my God, please. Please don't let that be depressing as fuck. Fucking hell, fucking hell. Why we get one win and then it go to depression? Can we have some happy moments, my nigga? Don't nobody care about how you feel. So first and foremost, I just want to say I did hear this song before but it was the sample. The song is called I Wanted to Leave by SYML and it was all over TikTok. That's where I know it from. I didn't know that Lana sampled it. That's actually fucking cool. Shout out to SYML. Smile. Oh, it's smile. God. I just realized, oh, fuck. whatever. Let me just get into the little thing that I wrote down for Paris, Texas, what it means and what I have to think about. It's a little happier sounding. It's a little, uh, yeah. So verse one seems simple at first. Lana is continuing what she said in the fingertips she's running away without telling anyone and doesn't want to deal with the trauma set from the loss she's left to paris texas a place i'm fond of not because i went there or anything but i remember it was in rugrats go to paris well france yes but see, i've been to paris uh texas and Dublin. and shit had me dying as a kid and i would make jokes with my family about this when i found out about like oh yeah there's other cities with european city names here in uh, ontario or or in fucking America and shit. And it was funny to me. If I told you, yeah, I take trips to London every few months. You'll think, oh yeah, I'm full of money, whatever. I'm a broke ass nigga. Broke nigga alert. Broke nigga alert. Is it talking about me? Broke nigga I alert. Think so, my nigga. Broke nigga. You know where I go every few months? London, Ontario. To meet up with friends. London, Ontario is depressing. And it's just like London weather. You also have a Paris, Ontario, but it's named after Plaster of Paris. It's like a whole Plaster of Paris factory over there. But there's a reason why why she chose Paris, Texas. It's another media reference and more specifically the movie Paris, Texas. I don't want to spoil the plot. It's a good movie. It plays on not being able to run away from one's problems. Shout out to It's Just Cinema. We can't outrun our problems because our problems live inside us. It also has themes of depression, loss, and the creation of memories, which is in this album itself. Lana also looks eerily like the main character's wife in the movie. Like, look at it. It's, it's uncanny, it's scary. In the chorus here, I think we're seeing a pattern for Lana. She is running or maybe it's tour cause she's constantly moving around, which would make more sense under that lens. But it seems like every time the thoughts, the white noise, the feeling and depression starts to come back, Lana moves. She knows when it's time and it's time to go. And this is happening constantly. This makes the Rosemead and Ramita line in the grants makes it more sense. It makes it make more sense. Oh my God, I cannot speak English in this part. Holy shit, I was so emotional. It's more cohesion and self-reflecting. Uh, I love it. That's what I love about a lot of albums. There's so much cohesion within the songs and the, just the albums in general. In verse two, I honestly think I'm looking for needles in a haystack or a where's Waldo on a picture the size of a billboard, but drawn in the same proportion as the kids books, right? So Lana is traveling across the American landscape, just like in Paris, Texas, the movie. She went to Paris, Texas. She's going to to Florence, Alabama, seeing friends and documenting a journey, most likely writing music. Later, she talks about going to Venice Beach, California, another European named American town. So when she said, I took a train to Spain, this can't be a coincidence, right? But I think it is. I spent 30 minutes trying to find American towns named Spain or Spain adjacent. There's like a whole Wikipedia page based on US places named after non US places. I checked Google as well. Shit, there are two 
towns. One is South Dakota, which is just cornfields and like five houses and is literally in the middle of nowhere. And then there's one in Georgia, which has an abandoned train track system. It's in the middle of nowhere with weeds everywhere and bushes surrounding it. It's like right next to a small town called Quitman, Georgia. So I don't know if my theory fits. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Maybe we weren't supposed to know and maybe we'll learn about that later in the album or another album. We don't know. I don't know. So here in the bridge, this displays what Lana's mindset really is. Misery loves company. The second people get a little too happy, it's time for Lana to leave. She wants to be around others who are just as sad as her. It's the only way she'll ever feel fine. She has guilt for living life when her loved ones aren't. A piece of her died alongside those people she cared about. And then in verse three, she gets back home and she's alone. And I don't know if she has a boyfriend or she's still with the boyfriend she mentioned in Kitsugi, but he's gone. No one worried, no one asking, just left alone in her home. And this goes right back to Luther Vandross, man. Makes you question a lot. I'm just happy it's a happy sounding song for once. It's not depressing. Another Lana record with a long ass fucking title. I don't want this to be like of her uncle who had like a affinity for fishing. Him being the grandfather. Because... It's already demonstrated that the uncle loves fishing or maybe the whole family loves fishing. I don't know. But if we get to that little segment where it's like, yeah, we already know that the grandfather's passed away. So fucking more depression. <laughs> Oh, oh, it sounds kind of happy. I mean, this is good, right? This is this is progress, right? Instead of like being deeply depressed, she's just praying to God that her grandfather is looking over her father. Progress, stepping stones. <laughs> oh, at least. Three, three white butterflies. To be honest, those might be angels. You know what? This song will probably go hard at a white Christian church. Don't think that I'm being racist when I say that. There's quite a difference between white church and black church. Y'all spot the difference. Let's go. I fuck with this heavy. This is a little happier. Okay, why why did I downturn to a depressive note? We're getting real positive right here. Positive vibes. Lyrics might be depressing, but really she just said, "Hey man, protect my father. Look down on my father from up above. I sent three angels, three butterflies. Look after us. At least tell us that they're okay up there. Send a sign. This is good. We're on the up and up. You know we were on a downturn since track one, and now since track ten, we we climbing up, baby." All right, the long ass title that I'll probably forget about. Grandfather, please stand on the shoulders of my father while he's deep sea fishing. In the intro, we start off with something very powerful and packed with so much but condensed. Lana wants God to show her a sign as stated in the pre-chorus, but she uses the three white butterflies, which I think might represent her three lost loved ones, which she mentioned in fingertips, her grandparents and her uncle. She just wants to feel their aura again in some sort of capacity. This also might be a callback to happiness as a butterfly from NFR to send some sort of positive affirming message that things will get better. Maybe if this self-reflection on Lana's part is to sit still and let the butterflies land, grieving is needed to 
heel. In the verse, Lana takes her aims at the doubters who think Lana is stretching it and doing a sob story for the album, but she isn't. People think the label hired thousands of people to make her look good, but they didn't. They think a man is running the show and is writing her songs filled with dark themes and the torment, the depression, and it's all fake, but it's not, it's real. This is all Lana. It's a message to all the doubters out there, man. In the pre-chorus, we expand the idea of the three white butterflies. Lana asking God to send an owl as a sign for her to stop drinking as well. She wants a sign that her uncle is looking down and protecting her. That's what I think the owl is because he died in the wilderness in the Rocky Mountains and there's owls there. Even showing a sign that they want better from her, that she has more life to live rather than sinking her emotions into the bottom of a bottle. Then we get the chorus. And here it gets real dark after thinking about it for a bit. I think what Lana really wants is for God to send a sign for her father, that her grandfather is looking over her father while he's fighting his emotion. He's deep sea fishing, which I think might be the first reference to blue here, but for sure, 100% her father is sinking the use of the sea is literally his tears and the bridge here we get a lot of references to lana's past songs mirroring what she has been saying in this verse lana says that she's good in spirit she's living does it mean she's all the way good i don't think so mentally i mean damn my nigga we 11 songs in i'm depressed as fuck hearing what lana is saying but with the positive as sounding song i think she's okay i think she feels a little better like i don't think she's okay in the slightest up here but everywhere else i mean yeah we then swing to lana saying that she's a fallible deity which in fact is a reference to west coast from ultra violence and gods and monsters from paradise lana is now in that position of power she is the big rock star the mainstream and yet she's fully aware of her flaws and knows she's misusing her influence she's wrapped up in white which i think is trying to make herself display as pure and innocent and intent well we'll get back to that next we get references to blue banister with the self-titled song with her still healing and being in the gray the mix of blue and green this also makes it official that this is the first reference of blue on the album which is pretty late and is crazy to me because usually it comes early in the albums and that's food for thought for me then here while reading this it took me out she has a line saying regrettably a white woman oh lord have mercy regrettably a white woman is there not a nigga in sight that will tell her this is like politically posturing? Like, come on, man. I can't care for the white guilt. Like, put some money in a nigga's books or some black college tuition or something. Like, if you're a real ally, squabble up with a racist. You know what I mean? If you see a racist, punch that nigga in the face. You see a fascist, punch him in the face. If you're a white man, say the N-word or get homophobic, run the fake, nigga. And I've seen Reddit threads and forum threads calling her the problematic queen, which I understand now. And I look key enjoy the music it's just come on man all i gotta say is this lana you see a racist run the fade man just like how you were trying to push azalea banks have that same energy for all the racists not just like fuck a trump i really mean like you see some racist shit be a good ally and catch the fade you got lawyer money be a real white ally bro if she really want to get with the oh yeah i'm woke shit you gotta get down with the with the real niggas taylor swift don't know shit bro stop hanging around with her hang out with the weekend more that nigga really know what the fuck going on you need to tap in with the weekend again i'm gonna be honest with you the weekends he's pretty sound in his takes whatever he does just copy him if the weekend put out four million dollars for gaza do the same hey man but i enjoy lana she's a problematic queen stop the white guilt punch a racist in the face punch a homophobe in the face and that's all i gotta say all right it's a new dawn it's a new day it's a new light back with another day it's taken me two days to react to this album you know why i literally cried after i fucking stopped recording all right and said this is too much emotionally i'm gonna give myself a break and then that's it i took the rest of the day off and now i'm back recording on a weekend Maybe, maybe this is maybe this is too much let the light in featuring father john misty who was in the music video for let the light in all right everything's rushing back in again why oh my god okay okay let's go pick you up at home quarter to three ask you if you want something to eat let the light your back door yelling cause I wanna come in. All 
All right, this is a lot more positive than I thought. Oh my God. Oh my God, we're on the home stretch. I thought the rest of this album was gonna be more depressing. Never oh, had it. Oh, 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 oh. It sounds way happier. Oh fuck. Yo, we on the home stretch, man. Let's go, let's go. Turn your light on. Why does she sound like White Iverson on this? Am I am I am I in the wrong for saying that? She's using the Post Malone like White Iverson flow. Maybe I'm on to nothing. All right. Maybe I'm on to nothing. Yeah. I'm vibing the fuck out. Ignore the ashy elbows. Play this on a road trip around America, around Canada, where the mountain backdrops happen, rocky mountains everywhere, trees. Oh my God. Gotta let the light in. There's cracks, bro. The light is coming in, bro. Oh my god, yo, this is beautiful. Yo, have this in a coffee shop, something, man. This is like real aura right here, all right? You put this in the shop in the background while everybody... Ooh. And that's not a diss. You put this in the coffee shop, bro, in the background. It's gonna hit. Just the aura itself, bro, next to Nora Jones and shit. This gonna go crazy on the playlist, I swear to God. If I'm driving, I'm putting this shit on. Facts. I love this song, man. I'm glad we on the up and up and mood, all right? We had our serotonin drop to the fucking levels of hell. I done seen Beelzebub, okay? I done seen the devil. I done seen demons. Demons, little demons. When we got the fingertips, we saw little demons come out. I had tears running through my eyes, right into my notes, nigga. Paris, Texas. I had motherfucking tears running down my goddamn cheeks. Now we get to let the light in. I feel a little more happier all right let the light in we in a tizzy right now relationship kind of crazy it seems like a little rocky you know what i mean so let's just start it off okay so lana is teethied up with amanda all right she picked this guy up they go out to drink go out to eat they do it all over again kind of like a date but it gets bonkers when she starts waking this guy up at 12 45 a.m talking about let's do it again like what the fuck are you doing up at like 1 a.m. calling a dude? It is kind of weird, you know what I mean? But me at least, no one's calling me past 10 o'clock, all right? I got sleep, I got a job. We got things to do. What are you doing, Lana? I know you got some shit, but oh, come on, man. Some people got some nine to fives. You gotta be considerate with some people, right? Then we get to the pre-chorus, and yeah, they go straight to pound town. Saying she doesn't like when he leaves, so she's telling him she- I'm wearing nothing at all. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Under an overcoat and his devious place. I don't know why you doing that to this man. You gotta let him go sometimes, man. Shit, I don't know if you reckon with your loneliness or something, but you, come on, man, you can't just be fucking just, just to not feel lonely, you know? Even if there's a meeting tomorrow or he's gotta wake up early in the morning, she doesn't care. You coming back to me type shit. Then we get to the chorus, and honestly, I thought this was all good vibes until I realized the title was Let the Light In. And I don't know if this relationship is a distraction or or the fling is a distraction in itself. It makes me wonder what's happening next because there's cracks starting to form with the erratic behavior. You know what I mean? Lana's going to this man's back door trying to get in to see him, right? This is repeating over and over again throughout the courses, which means she's probably doing this over and over again with this guy, just doing this multiple times, right? She's using him like a drug, the need to not be alone. It's a desperate act to not deal with her feelings. She's using this guy like a drug, basically. Then we get to verse two, and this honestly feels like this got stripped directly from the next best American record off of NFR between Lana and her lover trying to make the next best songs. But here it's a love song instead of just the greatest American song. And then it's right after that they just get the then we get to the bridge. I think it's straightforward, but I think it's deviously too simple for it to be straightforward. And I think it's obvious that she's chasing that this lust. She doesn't want to fight. She doesn't want to hate this guy. Only to be in a state of good vibes and good times. And just kick it like Tribe Called Quest. But again, this is a distraction from reality. It's not a real relationship. It's just a fling. We get confirmation that this is only just an attempt for Lana to not be lonely. She wants and needs some. Not because she really loves him, but to let the light in. Those cracks are dead definitely showing and then we get to the tv and the flowers and the vase now i don't know if this is a reference to roses and violets or the white noise and candy necklace but it might be it might be that chasing feeling that okay
okay shit the depression's coming back in you know what i need i need this body again i need this guy again she's just running away bro but at least she knows and at least the song sounds happy even though it's running and not dealing i don't know how people do it bro this is sad all right margaret featuring the bleachers okay oh yeah it's swinging in Shout out to the engineer, because they're doing wonders on this song, uh, on this album. He had flashes of the good life. His life, should I jump off this building now or do it on the double? What? Jump off the building? Baby, if your love is in trouble. Please, not, not depression. You know, you know. The answer is no. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know if this is supposed to be a love song or a song about how do you know when to kill yourself? If this whole song is like just a double entendre on the two, brother, what? I don't need like a happy song about Sue. Come on, man. Hey, I'm really fucking with this. We got real scary at the very beginning. I thought, oh shit, this was going to be like a, a suicide song. I'm not going to lie to you. Jumping off the roof when you know you know. What you mean by that? I don't know if that was like, oh yeah, you know, I, I found love type shit. I just have to have a leap of faith or like... You know what I mean? Margaret. There's a lot of things that I found out about this song that I didn't know before. After many years of collaborating with each other on the production side, we finally get a Jack Antonoff and Lana Del Rey collab. I didn't know that was Jack Antonoff. I don't know what the bleachers are. Apparently that's his band, so that's cool. Uh, funny enough, his wife's name is Margaret and she's an actor. I used a clip of her from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood uh, when we were talking about Charles Manson and NFR. I'm doing callbacks now. You know what I mean? I'm just like Lana. I'm gonna presume this song's about Margaret and Jack's relationship. Obviously, shout out to Wikipedia for telling me about that. First one, it seems like Lana is examining what a good relationship looks like by using Jack Antonoff as her subject. She wants to know how and what love looks like and feels like. At the beginning, you hear that she's still not okay, right? She's still a mess, and the second line explains it all. We then see how Jack fell for his wife for the first time. He wasn't looking for it, and I feel like when he said, I might be in trouble, he was only looking for for someone that he wanted to hook up with you know what i mean he was in his whole face and he was fucking like crazy dog. <laughs> so when he met her it was lights out this man was in love he ain't do no whole shit no more he is at that life he's seen her and saw a future and at the end of the verse we just see a crazy juxtaposition between the album and the song so far majority of this album has been suicidal as fuck no holds bar just straight into a big hole of despair it's like being rko straight into depression okay Our serotonin levels went all the way to fuck down we saw hell we saw beelzebub we saw the devil himself you know what i mean so in the context of this album the jump off from the building rooftop is literal when it's in the shoes of jack antelof it's a leap of faith into a relationship he's eager to get into it now and that's what i was scared of man i thought this was a <laughs> I thought this was a double entendre, but you know, you gotta see the life in different lenses. In the pre-chorus and chorus, here is a confirmation of knowing when the relationship is going well. There's signs that's all around. If you're questioning it, then it's not real. And I don't have to spell it out for you. All of Lana's albums, she has been questioning her love, if it's real or not. Every single album, there isn't one where she's not questioning it, right? She's not questioning that love or questioning this guy. When you know, you know. And Lana and Jack laugh at their past selves being naive because in the moment they think they are, but when you look at the signs it's not the signs are on the wall man and then there's a line that says when you're good in gold and i like that i want to say it's like a callback to kintsugi and the love healing their broken hearts but i'm not 100 convinced about that but I, if it is hey man lana, lana lana knows how to write bro she really with it so verse two in the song i didn't really hear it but when it's written out i thought it started off like a bronx nigga saying where's my fat ass mother but Jack is saying, if you're going through it in your relationship, whether it's red flags coming from your partner or needing a white knight to honor you, even though your partner's in the wrong or getting abused, if you have to convince yourself and ask yourself, are they really the one for me? The answer is a resounding fucking no. Love is hard. Relationships are tricky. You need to convince yourself that you love them. You don't. You're chasing something that's not there. And that's how Jack knew he was in love. He just knew this was a good thing. This was a good feeling. This is a good vibe. Also, not gonna lie 
side this conflicts with what judah smith was saying in the interlude so i feel like this might give some sort of internal conflict on what love and lust is while the pastor says you need a fight jack says no and i guess it only works if your partner really fighting for this relationship to work after making a mistake i don't know if the pastor of judah smith is divorced or not but i don't know you just you just gotta see it you gotta work day by day and see if it is i'm confused about that part you know what i mean but i think this is progress like her friends in love you know then we get to the chorus which is kind of reframed right so the chorus gets expanded here and it adds a lot of context uh, to how one knows they're in love right you just know when you know it's like when you're old you know you're old you have aching bones and shit just like lana struggles between her and hollywood and relationship with fame then the mention of the diamond ring which we all know is a sign of engagement you give it to a person you love as a promise of marrying each other and having a long life commitment to each other and the relationship it's straightforward just like what lana says at the beginning but lock in i really do think this is a callback to candy necklace and the presumed love that lana thought she had here compared to the real thing like a diamond ring and at the end i think this song really gives lana insight to what she really wants but also learning what to look for the feeling of knowing when you're right and how you know what is right no more questioning just observe and it'll show itself that's it uh, i do want to add at the end though glad it's happy i'm glad it's happy oh my god we, we on the up and up we on the up and up we on the up and up all right fishtail Huh. Damn. God damn. This actually sound like an older like weekend song. I'm not gonna lie to you. This is hard. Even though I think the lyrics are kind of depressing, but I think Lana just she got the tools to understand what real love is, and now it's like nah, I see it. Like this ain't working out, brother. You ain't there for me. You ain't trying to braid my hair when you say you were. Which, that's commitment. You know what I mean? Touching a woman's hair is like a very intimate act. Touching a woman's hair is a very serious act. You ain't gonna fuck around with a woman's hair, especially a black woman's hair. I didn't did it one time. I was fearful for my life, bro. She was okay with it, but I didn't want to fuck up because that that is very, very, very sensitive. Hair for women is like a very serious thing. To insist that you're going to do your girl's hair and then never do it is like, whoa, whoa. Even insisting to do your girl's hair or braiding your girl's hair, that's a serious act, bro. You ain't doing that to every woman. I'm telling you, man. What? What? Wait, 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 wait. She's sunbathing in the river of LA with nothing but her 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 bruises on her knees or some shit? What the fuck? What is that supposed to mean? Is that like she's they found her in the LA River dead? Cause who sunbathes there? That shit is like the LA River is nasty, bro. You don't go there. I seen too many skate videos where people were jumping that fucking gap and they sink in. It's full of shit. Sunbathing over there? I don't even want to imagine how that smells. I can't stay. You wanna be Wait, skipping rope on the bayou? Wait, won't you sink? That's like swamp. Whoa. Okay, there's a lot of things going on here. Again, this does sound like an early weekend song. Self-admittedly, I will say this. I haven't listened to a weekend album before. Beauty Behind the Madness and Onwards, I never listened to. I think I listened to a little bit of Kiss Land because it was all over the radio, but I never listened to the trilogy except for Wicked Games. So maybe I gotta react to that too. Let's look into what the lyrics are about. All right, Fishtails.
Now I know what a fishtail is. It's a braiding technique. I didn't know that. I thought that was I thought it was gonna be on some like some drug shit, but we never really got into drugs that much. So let's really dive into it. Let me see what this is all about. And then you know, I want to get my understanding of what this song's about. The story's on here. Fishtail intro. We get an abrupt intro. I think it might be a metaphor rather than at a friend or a lover. Maybe the audience. They said they'll braid Lana's hair, which is an intimate act in itself. When we talked about it, you need someone you trust to do your hair right and i'm not really familiar on how to do the fishtail braids i did look at a couple youtube tutorials and how to do it solo and it looked complicated as shit especially if you don't know what you're doing or know how to braid hair which i don't think most men do and if you do hey man kudos to you but the promises and not doing them is the issue and maybe it's the label saying that they'll do things when they don't or maybe this is actually a real guy but nevertheless it's about trust issues so we then get to the first verse we start off with what seems like lana mindset right now wait she's skipping rope while she's sinking in the swamps of the bayou right having to jump in murky waters filled with things underneath in which you can't see she knows it's not smart but she doesn't care and she does it anyways then we see lana say she sees palm trees in black and white and likes to see them sway this reminded me of cherry from lust for life when lana says that she looks at memories and celluloid scenes which are warm and fuzzy here it's in black and white like film noir where most of the time the motivations are cynical and depressing and it's a byproduct of the great depression right so i really do think there's a link between depression the palm trees and seeing it in black and white right these are her thoughts now and they're bleak and then we hear lana say that she wants a skinny dip in her lover's mind right and i know this has a reference in nfr but i can't think of it right now where lana said that she wanted to get emotionally naked with her lover in the past and it's similar but here i think what's being said is lana thinks that like mentally he's just sweet like shit ain't really going on no anger anguish no depression no emotional draining feelings of despair how he does not need to combat shit in his mind there's no trauma at all lana can just skinny dip in that motherfucker raw and end up all right if it was the other way around i don't think so lana be going through a lot of shit mentally in the pre-chorus i really do think this is one big reference to hope is a dangerous thing for a woman like me to have but i have it because that was the last time for us the listener seeing things on how it used to be when mentioning the nightgown last time she did it we heard that Lana was going 24 7 Sylvia Platt, writing blood on the walls like Charles Manson and the swords but this time is more tame but not really here lana talks about a time where her and her man would just hang out and he'd push her on the swings and just chill yeah i totally missed this this is my first reaction i was kind of like blinding myself from the more depressing undertones i mean it's overtone over here talking about hanging herself underneath a old oak tree but yeah you, you can kind of tell like i was you know but in the course we see he just wanted her sadder much like mariner's apartment complex where her significant other used her sadness out of context and really just try to manipulate her in the song right but he's playing with her emotions he says that she loves her but he doesn't display it at all and it shows that lana took what she learned from margaret and is applying it here she doesn't want to waste her time anymore then lana references ella fitzgerald in the air and i think she's referencing the song so rare where ella says yes you're an angel i breathe and i live for you lana felt that at the time but now she really doesn't feel that we then get back to braiding hair where again it's a metaphor for commitment even in our times then we get the verse two we start off with dancing in a hot sun and by now we already established what dancing is it's the daily minutia of life we really don't need to get into that part but she knew she had problems from day one but she's been pushing it off because i think now it's cementing that she doesn't want to be alone uh to deal with the overall loneliness that she knows she has and she's gonna deal with when this relationship is over to be totally honest i think we're getting into the crux of it all when it comes to lana either serial dating or just lust itself this whole album is illustrating lana running away from her problems and not wanting to deal with them heartbreak after heartbreak she knows from the start that it's been bad from the beginning and it's just now sinking in that she only deals with these men because she doesn't want to deal with herself again from the ending of nfr shaking my ass is the 
only thing that's got this black narcissist off my back. This is like internal demons playing in film noir. Then we expand the palm trees in the black and white. This time we're told that Lana can see in Technicolor, which used to be a company that developed colored film back in the day. But this makes me think of Wizard of Oz going from black and white to color. But the palm trees are the only things in black and white, so I don't know what's happening. Maybe the palm trees is like a metaphor for LA itself and how she's always been depressed in LA and anytime she escapes, it's in color. We finally see Lana admitting that she's seeing the relationship in rose tinted glasses and she's purposely painting the red flag screen in order to make this work. But we all know from Margaret, it just means that she's doomed to fail. So then we get to the pre-chorus and this is a crazy visual to digest. I'm thinking of a few things this might say, whether she's at rock bottom on her knees pleading to God after being burnt by the relationship for a sign she's mentioned skinny dipping in this guy's head in the first verse and i'm thinking she's emotionally naked at this point just trying to get answers like how i see it is that the la riverbed is grimy when droughts happen the la river is just empty we see it being used in movies all the time and, and nothing much going on in the summers over there but you'll see la's nasty water much like the bio but having a concrete bottom it's cemented right so sunning in the la riverbed might mean hitting rock bottom and laying there the bruises on the knees and wearing nothing at all falls in line with being emotionally naked and pleading or it could just mean sucking on some sh I think that's a simpler thing to think, but I don't know if it's that. Maybe the bruises might also mean being just fucked up and stumbling and falling because she's not sober. Who knows? Maybe that's a big stretch, just like Drake fans finding dirt on Kendrick Lamar, right? And vice versa. At the end, Lana kind of just reiterates what she's saying in an intro and chorus. My final thoughts on the song? It's good, man. This is like a great turnaround. Peppers featuring Tommy Genesis, Canadian Queen. Hey, shout out Peppers featuring Tommy Genesis. Is Canadian Queen. Hey, shout out Tommy Genesis. I will shout out Canadians whenever I see them. Shout out to my Canadians out there, our undercover Americans. We live amongst y'all. You know how like there's conspiracy theories about reptiles? Think about that with Canadians. You can't tell us apart, can you? Hands on your knees, I'm Angelina Jolie. Hands on your knees. Ain't no way, ain't no way Lana sampled fucking Angelina Jolie. How tapped in is Lana Del Rey? Nah, this is scary. How tapped in is Lana Del Rey with fucking awful records? Father produced this motherfucker. I love father. I love ethereal. Fat Man Key was in fucking awful records. Zach Fox. Come on, man. Awful records was, was the fucking shit. I think, yeah, Lana's tapped in then. God damn! Hands on my knees, Angelina Jolie. Hands on my knees. I fuck with this. You know what's crazy? If this album won a Grammy, Father would've won a Grammy for production. He would've gotten a production credit and won a Grammy. That also means that Father is a Grammy nominated fucking artist or producer. He's a Grammy nominated producer. Same with Tommy Genesis. She's a Grammy nominated fucking artist. Also, this song is fucking insane. Especially Angelina Jolie. Not on the prowess of like production, but it's a good song. Don't get me wrong, but Tommy Genesis is really just flexing her being like a head bitch in charge. Like Angelina Jolie was it like a sex anthem. All right, so Peppers. <laughs> shout out to Tommy Genesis. Shout out to Father. Grammy nominated now. Let's get down to the chorus. So in this song, they sample Tommy Genesis, Angelina, in which she talks about being the head bitch in charge, getting her mind off of her ex's dick by, and I quote, When you leave me, I need to go take my mind off your dick. Get some yoga cover. A pretzels in a pound of a clip it's a bisexual anthem for the girlies and the chorus is crazy because it's about riding and telling the nigga to braid her hair while and I was gonna say that regardless, the bridge just means trust, right? And commitment. And the first verse, Lana gets wild and I think it's self-explanatory, right? What she's doing is she's being an exhibitionist and they can't get their hands off each other. They make songs together and then they get the fucking like crazy. Oh, 
and they ain't even trying they just on the same time and here in the pre-course we see lana letting go she threw cautious in the wind and allows him to just skinny dip in her mind she's being emotionally naked with this guy just like letting him experience all of her and it seems like he just gels with her she professes her love now to maybe the feeling of being absolutely free with this man something we ain't hear all album was lana saying that she's free and again for the first time this is just like what the fuck like we usually get lines about i'm feeling free i'm being free now we don't even hear it it's good i don't know though in the next line she does say that she had a knife in her jacket so she's still protecting herself in the midst of falling in love right then i'm not sure it's directly a reference to nectar of the gods but honey on the vine though in nectar of the gods lana was questioning her status and fame and whether she's using it for good and also understanding that she's an addict to it all i do think this is more of a direct reference to matt monroe's song of the same name honey on the vine where he sings about being madly in love why do i think this is a direct reference because lana samples the next two lines with coffee and wine both being sweet not being as sweet as honey on the vine this makes me rethink about the john baptiste interlude with its mention of honey as well maybe it's about a love of drugs i don't know in the second verse this should get real crazy and it's like nah lana wild enough lana saying that she's owning her own body that she's the head bitch in charge then we get a reference to bartender with the red truck where she uses it just to move low around la then we get to the most wild part of the song here lana saying that her boyfriend tested positive for the virus the coffin virus you know the virus that <coughs> Two years out of our lives but the fact is is that she said that she didn't care and she gonna do whatever he be doing you know what i mean because she loves them like that and she gonna go through whatever because yeah and that's kind of wild to me because like kind of like a std what happens if you get herpes or the clap or something you're gonna be down for that too like there's no love in my heart that can ever be okay with someone saying that oh yeah i got symptoms for something you know and not telling me and then saying <laughs> i tested positive and it's careless as fuck there's no love in my heart for that shit maybe by mistake but i i'll put that on someone's head for the rest of my life for real all right final track <laughs> taco truck cross vb i'm still trying to figure out what the vb means met my boyfriend down taco truck okay i can be violent too violent that's why they when i'm violent it's carlito's way but on my feet on the street i'm dancing crazy spin it till you whip it wait 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 don't come near rosita i'll go crazy we gonna go violent like carlito's way blood on my feet on the street going crazy hold on what the fuck lana jack and sets those lines add up too too much <laughs> Yo, this has to be a stretch, but that that sound like crit like she she full on cripping. There's too many coincidences in those bars. Yo, this is just Venice Bitch. What the fuck? This is a remix. Holy shit. It's kids.
That was such a great ending, bro. Holy shit, we finally got to the end. It was so much better than I thought. We 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 arrived back to NFR with Venice bitch. I don't know what that meant. I don't know if it's like the same guy came back or like she found a guy exactly like him. Revisiting feelings from Venice bitch. Nah, this is cool. Though the taco truck part, I'm still side-eyeing. There's too many red alarms going up here. It's just like, I mean, there's too many coincidences going on where it just like, it sound like affiliated shit. All right, so Taka Truck and Phoebe. I have a lot of thoughts here. A lot of funny thoughts, a lot of real thoughts, a lot of confusing thoughts, and a lot of things I want to talk about this album in particular before we just end it off, right? Taco Truck and VB. So this is exactly like A and W, where it has two parts. Maybe that's why it's called A and W. It's A and W, and it's two parts. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm reading way too into it, right? Anyways, it feels like we get callbacks and closure here. Kinda. Like, this is the part two to NFR. While chemtrails and blue banisters was the escape away, this is the return back home to LA, Venice Beach. So we start off with part one, with verse one. It honestly feels like somewhat of a healed Lana, or maybe a numb Lana. Here we see Lana talk about her potential Margaret moment, meeting her boyfriend at a taco truck. So I don't know if she was there with a friend or talking to him while she sharing a vape, but she seems nervous for sure. Needing a vape to calm her nerves down a little. Maybe trying to get numb to get to a level of not giving a fuck. Lana paints a perfect picture of the day they met. Clear blue skies, most likely in LA winter time, just falling for each other. I do have thoughts on the weather portion and thinking whether it was something to take at face value or something of a metaphor for how she feels. Continuing the theme of being numb, but being okay and fine. I was thinking at one point that the Caribbean blue was a reference to Anya's song from 1991, but that might be a stretch. Uh, even though she's in love, she's cold as well when she needs to. This then can play into the I can be violent line as well, stripping away empathy of some sort, even though we know in the past songs, Alana was talking about empathy uh, at some point, right? Now, I don't know if this also talks about banging sets with the Caribbean blue. The reason why I'm saying that she's banging sets is because why is she pressing violence on this? Blood on my feet? Like she or something talking about dancing crazy and a whole lot of assortments of c's c's everywhere she's alliterating with c's like what is this all about do we got videos of lana crip walking in this hole replacing b's with c's fucking with the mexican homies what's going on man also i'm not gonna reveal any of the gang names or the associated neighborhoods or anything in the area of Reseda. it's not like c's and b's i kind of know that it's on some other shit but i'm an outsider and most of y'all are too so i do not want to like share whatever shit they got going on but anyways free all the homies free the ghetto peace to all of them shout out to la shout out to la culture all that shit they in a different lane i don't do anything i'm a civilian anyways we start off with the lanita line i thought this was gonna be a reference to something when really it's just a combination of lana and bonita so people just call her beautiful lana and i don't know why lana's wigging out on people trying to find her in Reseda. maybe she does pay dues for protection i don't know who knows it's none of my business it's none of my business you know what i mean lana mentions the real chain that she got then she says that she's gonna get violent like Carlito's way. I don't know, but hey, I ain't messing with Lana, you know what I mean? I'm not messing with her bag, whatever. I love Lana. I know she's packy. And if she got friends doing the same, hey, I trust it. You know what I mean? Them the homies. Shout out to Lana, man. Free the homies, free the ghetto. Then we got Lana showing that she clearly does not give a single fuck about the media now. And all the shit stirring and them having to spin narratives. Because it doesn't phase her anymore. This really is a big turnaround for Lana. Usually it's her kind of feeling bad because of the tabloids but now it's just expected and she doesn't really care at the end of the day she got her core audience her friends her family and her connections and that's all that matters fuck is a pitchfork review about to do fuck is a page six about to do nothing they just be yapping on them pages bro it's nothing and that that's growth right there outro of part one then we get margaret talking about having trouble sleeping and then transition to part two this is literally just venice beach which makes me wonder if this whole album took place in between the Mariners apartment complex or to just NFR or to give NFR a different context or maybe showing that Lana is in a perpetual cycle that will lead her back to the ending of NFR with hope is a dangerous thing and you know the rest of the title I'm not gonna say it all or maybe she got back with her ex and not doing what they did last time in LA smoking weed by the Guardian so much is baked into this album it feels like a whole retrospective of everything that we got in the past into new songs new context on old songs a lot of fan fair is going on here we also have 
some of, if not the most depressing music on this album that Lana has ever released, ever. I thought the past albums were bad. I thought Ultra Violence was bad. This is 10 times worse than that. I had trouble getting through this album because I was fucking sad. And I think now that I expect it, I can re-listen to it but I'm not 100% sure. It is one of the most depressing albums I've ever listened to in my life. It's on par with Elliot Smith. It's even more depressing than fucking some rap songs. And while on some rap songs, we had literal moments of experiencing grief. Elliot Smith had talking about his depression and fucking suicidal tendencies. And then finding out that, yeah, Elliot Smith literally stabbed himself in the heart two times. I don't know how a person does that, but that man was so suicidal he did that. And talking about drug addiction, that led to the fucking end of it all this is bad too this is fucking bad this is dis like this album destroyed my mental health for a day you know the music is so good if you're that moved that you had to take a fucking break i think this was like literally the perfect album because it gave me a lot more context within the past albums it gave me a lot more insight on lana on how she even began her journey to now we got insight on why she even got pushed away into boarding school in the mental health ward we got a little glimpse of it in blue banister but now we got the whole picture between Kemp trails and blue banister and why lana had to leave we got glimpses into born to die talking about loved ones that she lost her love that she lost talking about why lana is the way she is throughout all the albums and why she's chasing love all the time and why she's always falling in love because it's not really love it's just lust and needing to feed loneliness the whole time like this album is the the codec to all of lana's music and definitely i feel like if i started here and went all the way back to and then ended it at blue banister i don't think i will ever appreciate lana's discography the way it is it's touching bro i never get to experience a whole person's discography within two months and then like really appreciating their whole discography usually whenever i listen to artists i listen to him in the time it's in and then having to wait a year two years three years Years, five years for the next album and then going back and listening to the old stuff and like not really appreciating it as much as like someone who listened to it for the first time so getting to experience the whole discography for the first time and then really sitting down learning what all the music is about learning the whole discography in and out reading the lyrics breaking everything down and assembling it all together i get this image of who the artist is and who lana is or lizzie grant or whatever it's amazing bro i appreciate this album so much and i feel like i love this album more than any other album because it's like it does feel like a retrospective but also like giving so much so much context on uh, missing key things that happened throughout all of her past albums like we're given that here so much fanfare i'm a lana fan now uh <laughs> she is a problematic queen how i rank this hey man again it's it's lana's best i'm putting it as number one anyways if there's anybody you think i need to react to next put it in the comments as well if you haven't please like and subscribe did you like it did you hate it what do you rate it my name is lou and i'll see you next time see ya he's a eller he's a glazer his bitch got a cat i hit her with riz he's a eller he's a glazer his bitch got a cat i hit her with riz he's a eller he's a glazer his bitch got a cat i hit her with riz He's a Eller, he's a glazer, his bitch got a cat, I hit him with Riz. This video took f***ing forever.